I'd like to introduce uh, Lisa Schiltz, who is the, um, the John D. Herrick Professor of Law and the co-director of the Terence Murphy Institute for Catholic Thought, Law, and Public Policy at St. Thomas University. Lisa is also a, boor a board member of uh, uh, the National Catholic Partnership on Disability. She's also a board member of L'Arche USA, and she um, writes in, the, um, in Mirror of Justice, a, a really great legal blog if you're interested in that sort of thing. So please uh, help me welcome Lisa and the return of our speakers. We have a flood of questions. We're not possi possibly going to get to all of them, but I'm taking the moderator's prerogative, and I'm going to start with a couple of my own, and then we'll just start. We'll just we'll just move right into the into the questions from the pile. Um, and the first question that I just want to pose to Miguel is um, based on um, what we've heard today is a number of times, especially from from David, about um, how so much of the experience, so much of the reason that we're all drawn into this ministry is personal experience. Can you tell us a little bit about your personal experiences that drew you into the into the, the deep world of theological reflection about disabilities that you have shared with us? Absolutely. Um, so my I have two brothers. Um, uh, my younger brother is Martin. He's a firefighter. He's a big guy. And my older brother's name is Vicente. And Vicente has a profound intellectual disability. Um, uh, I'll talk about my brother this afternoon. Um, uh, it's always a question, do, I mean, do you lead with your brother? Do I talk about my brother first? Then there's that, what Jesus says about pearls and what, what you do with your pearls and where you don't toss them. And uh, now that's no comment on you, but um, I, uh, there's a, a, I've always had a question, if, if I lead with my brother, if I begin with Vicente, I always sometimes get worried that it'll sound like special pleading. Um, you know, it's like that, but this, these are resources. There are resources in the in the church, and and um, and it's, I think it's important to draw attention to those. And that that was uh, that was what I wanted to do this morning. But my brother's name is Vicente. And I'll tell you a whole lot about Vicente this afternoon. Um, but the quest, the theolo the theology of disability. I'm going to tell one quick story. And I wasn't sure if I was going to do it, but then I thought about it. Oh, I'll tell the story. This will be quick. Um, it all began for me uh, about 12 years ago. I was uh, enrolled in a class at university in graduate school, and the title of the class was The Theology of St. Thomas Aquinas. And um, my, that professor of that class happens to be here today. Um, uh, the Theology of St. Thomas Aquinas. And he said, why are you here? What's your interest? And they went around the room, and the question came to me, and I knew exactly why I was in that theology class, because everything I knew at that point, everything I had read about St. Thomas, told me that according to St. Thomas, uh, reason is what makes us human. Uh, what that means is that uh, my brother was not a human being, and what I said in the classes, I, I said, uh, according to St. Thomas, my brother's no better than a dog. Um, I think he's wrong, and I'm here to find out why he's wrong. And the, I received a, the comment that I received back was, uh, that's a good question. I, I only have one request. I encourage you to be patient with St. Thomas, and what you find may surprise you. Um, I don't know much about my patience, but I was surprised. And it was a gift that I, had, I could not have given to myself, uh, but the professor saying that to me, uh, oh, Dr. Hooter, thank you. <laughs> Um, uh, but that's where it began. Like, it began for me with a chip on my shoulder um, and something worth fighting for. Thank you. Thank you. Um, my next question is um, for David. Um, in, in this kind of a reaction to what you ended with, which is uh, your statement that you are the, the past of the disability of, of, the, of, the, of the movement here, and that, and that we are the future, and I just want to vehemently object to that. Um, when I was, when I was um, 35 years old, I was pregnant with my third child, and we found out that he was going to be born with Down syndrome, and I called my mom, um, and the first thing she said to me was so surprising. She, I have an older brother who has disabilities, and she raised him. And the first thing she said to me was, oh, Lisa, you're going to meet such wonderful people. 
that was it. That's you guys here. But then she also gave me like all her files and her pamphlets and everything that she had gotten, old yellow clippings from years back. She was, um, I was, I was the age that she was when she had me. And she had had my older brother about seven years before then, uh, mentally retarded. And he, at the, in the language of those times, one of the things she gave me, gave me was an old pamphlet by the Ligurian press about your retarded child in the church. And the message of that was on PC language and it was was some of the stuff that we would hate nowadays about your child is an angel, doesn't need the sacraments, blah, blah, blah. But also in there, over and over again, was you do not have to put your child in an institution. You can love your child. So this was the church way ahead of its time in the disability rights movement about institutionalization, telling, your, telling these Catholic parents what they needed to hear then. Then you write this statement um, way ahead of the ADA that is now um, prophetic in how we think the, and the disability rights people think think about people with disabilities. What's going to come in 20 years? What do you see the church prophetically saying now about people with disabilities that the rest of the world will catch up with in 20 years? Uh, the church? Am I on? Yeah, appears to be. Uh, the church itself, hard to know. Uh, and obviously, we're in a period of great distraction within the church currently. I don't know how long that's going to continue. Uh, whether or not issues like folks with disabilities or a wide number of other issues will get proper attention in that period of time probably depends on how much more sewage there is that is discovered over that period of time. I think the, the greatest influence is likely to come from secular society, actually. The uh, ADA, the influence of the ADA has been profound in American society. Uh, people just think in terms that they would not have thought 20 years ago, 30 years ago. And I would think that that is likely to continue because of the long heritage of American individualism. If uh, typical people start thinking in terms routinely of people with disabilities as just being a little different, uh, without that, uh, without any um, negative connotation to it. And I think over time, attitudes do improve. Uh, I was in England just most recently, and one of the remarkable things about Europe, if you have any sign of disability, and mine, is, as you can see, is quite minor, you go to the front of the line. I mean, that would not have happened. So I think just sort of a general sensitivity on people's parts is likely to drive the discussion more than within the church itself, but I hope I'm wrong. Thank you. So I'm going to I'm going to be um, there are some common themes in some of these question cards as I've gone through them. So some of my questions are capturing a lot of the um, uh, uh, common themes. Uh, and the first one that I want to raise is um, for um, for Miguel, um, and it it has to do with how do we translate the profound message that you have given us in your talk, the beautifully articulated truths about the artistic intent behind God's creating each of us with these shared vulnerabilities. How do we translate that idea into something that's um, that doesn't take um, um, a, a careful theological formation to understand and that can reach the young people of today who are steeped in this culture of, 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 of valorizing beauty and perfection? One way in to that, um, uh, to translate, the, uh, it, you can begin with the question of aesthetic perception. How do we see and know and recognize beauty? Um, to see and to recognize beauty is a skill that takes time to learn. Um, uh, when I think about my own experience with my brother, and when I think about the experience of others, you know, it takes a lifetime to learn to recognize the beauty of a life that is clumsy and um, and loud and goofy and messy and stinky. Uh, that's a beauty that you have to learn to see. And you can't learn to see that unless you have exemplars, unless you have saints, people who can show you the way, masters of this way of seeing the world, this way of moving through the world that 
enters into that beauty, to that form of life where it's okay that you are broken, it's okay that you're slow, it's okay if we spill things, it's okay if we are loud and goofy and clumsy. That's hard, and we need saints. So we need saints. That's it. That's all I got. We need people who, who can show us the way. And this room is filled with people, heroes in this room. Uh, many of you are me who are meeting for the first time, like, you are saints. Like, you have led the way. You have entered in uh, to this world, um, and you've moved with confidence and grace as you tripped and you fell and you were clumsy and you were broken and imperfect. That's what the world needs to see, and we need more people who are willing to be a mess. And, uh, and, and that's, and as, they, as they receive the sacraments and glory in the life of the church and rejoice, that is, that's the gift. That's what we need. That's the way, only way in. Now, the resources of the church when it comes to theology, thinking systematically, mm -hmm. thinking and drawing from the resources of, of the tradition, that's important. It's important work. We need to be thinking together. We need to put our best thoughts. And being clumsy, being goofy, being silly as creatures created in the image and likeness of God, that is worth thinking well about. Mm -hmm. If there's anything worth thinking, worth thinking well about, it's that. Excellent. I want to draw uh, these two, uh, your last two, both of your last two comments together a little bit and, and also pick up on a theme in a couple of these cards, which is... Um, we need more familiarity with people with disabilities. People that aren't in this club already need to be more familiar so they're not as afraid, so that they see the beauty that we have learned to see. Um, is a, um, I, I had uh, two friends who were, went to Catholic schools from, um, from age one through law school, and they had a child with Down syndrome, and so my husband and I were talking to them, and they are the most Catholic people you could imagine. They had adopted kids, and they're, they're wonderful, and they turned to us when we first met their baby and said, we've never known anybody with Down syndrome. That wouldn't happen if, if they had been educated in public schools. Um, so what can we do in our Catholic schools to create that shift in thinking that so many of our children who are educated in public schools have really started to have because they are with people with disabilities from day one of their education. They're familiar with them. They're used to being champions for their children with disabilities. Um, what can we do to our Catholic schools to give that same um, familiarity with our, um, with, our, with our young people in a way that doesn't require them to be saints? It just requires them to go to school every day and be with people with disabilities? Well, to some extent, <clears throat> it's a numbers game. Uh, the kind of numbers that have uh, dollar signs in front of them. Special education is expensive. And an awful lot of Catholic, as, as we all know, Catholic schools have been closing across the country rather than expanding the services they provide. So that's the short answer. The public sphere has many more resources than the Catholic sphere does. Um, how do you deal with that? There are, just to give an example of an organization in this area, a woman named Francesca Pellegrino, who I've known for quite a long time, started an organization called Catholic Coalition for Special Education, well, probably 25 years ago now. That organization raises money, which it distributes in the form of grants to Catholic schools in the area, Catholic elementary schools, in order to provide the resources to hire special ed teachers uh, to spread the word, if you will, uh, in that context. But I, I, and that's an excellent thing to do. It's obviously, you can only reach a small percentage of schools that way. I don't, other than getting some sort of federal help and getting a system in place to, to make that happen and make that permanent, I don't see that that difference in resources is going to change. Okay. Um, here's some, here's a, couple of, a couple of practical ones from the cards. What could I have said? In a parish, I invited a teen in a wheelchair uh, with spina, from spina bifida to a parish anointing of the sick for healing. He said, no, that would say to God that I am not happy with the way he made me. I couldn't think of anything to say. What would you say, Miguel? Uh, I, um, I, I think one of, the, one of the things that's beautiful uh, about 
when we attend to the healing ministry of Jesus in Scripture, um, when we understand uh, the dignity of the human being, what it means for us to be vulnerable and dependent by nature, and, and how our impairments, illness, and injuries fit into this larger understanding, the Christian understanding of, um, of original sin and the fall, when Jesus approaches uh, 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 folks who are impaired or ill or sick or blind, you know, he offers a gift, that uh, uh, a relief from a particular limitation or burden or challenge. But here's what doesn't change, and I think this is often overlooked. Sometimes those, those, uh, those, those, healing, those moments of healing in Scripture are views like, oh, this is uh, like some sort of divine judgment against the disabled in Scripture. Well, if we look at 10 to the whole sweep of the Gospels, you know, yeah, there's a relief from a particular burden in a particular time in a particular place, but that person is still vulnerable, is still dependent. That person, the impairment or illness is removed for a time, for that moment, um, but it's not removed from their life. They've still been formed and shaped by that experience in their life, and they still continue to be mortal, weak, vulnerable, and dependent beings. Um, it was a relief. It was a momentary relief. So, moving from Scripture uh, and, and the healing ministry of Jesus, when it, when it comes to the, the sacraments of the church and the graces offered by the church, one way to think about it is that this is a judgment against impairment, illness, and injury. Another way of thinking about it is it's, it, it's, a, it's a gesture, it's an invitation, it's a grace that's offered to be relieved of a limitation, a challenge, a difficulty for a time, but it's not going to make, um, it's, it's not the resurrection, it's not, it's not the, the, the final and complete, uh, it's not the completion. Um, that's how I think about it. Uh, another way of thinking about the particular sacrament is the way Pope John Paul II thinks about it in Salvifici Dolores. Um, uh, uh, he talks about binding, uh, binding our suffering to the suffering of Christ. Um, and how we complete the sufferings of Christ in our own bodies, that um, when we enter into the sacrament of, of healing we, uh, uh, and participate in that sacrament, we're not just doing a work for ourselves. We're actually doing a work offering up our limitation, burden, and challenge uh, to extend the redemptive work of Christ on the cross. Um, uh, that's a, it's a ministry that's offered to the full church and, and, and for the redemption of the world. So I'm going to ask for a little bit more follow-up on that, maybe from, from David, and just, because there, there are a couple of questions like this, and I, I, I also reacted um, so, somewhat negatively to going to a mass for disabled people in our, in our in our archdiocese, which was mostly about healing and suffering and in and, and, and those terms. So, so there's another way of formulating sort of the same question, and maybe I'll ask Dr. Byers to answer. What does uh, Thomas's theological anthropology have to say, or what does the more practical church document have to say uh, to the Phenomenon, phenomenon of faith healing, Protestant circles to healing prayer in Catholic circles. I don't know. I don't have anything particularly relevant to say about that. More generally, I was not happy to be born with spina bifida. And at that time, as I said in my talk, the chances of survival were about 100 to 1. And then I wasn't supposed to be able to walk. And I didn't take my first step until I was three. And then the third one was, you know, with the, the fluid that uh, goes up into your head from the spinal column. I was supposed to be um, um, not very bright. So I've always been grateful that one out of three, that's not bad. <laughs> uh, but uh, I never blame God for it. Just to go back to your prior question, which is what I was thinking of, uh, I never blame God for it. It's just lousy luck. And uh, like my, mo my mother would have said, and I think probably on several occasions did say, that it's for the good ultimately. That there's some reason why you were made this way. And uh, so I grew up and I did this, that, and the other thing, and I wrote the pastoral statement. So maybe <laughs> that's the good thing that came out of what I would call lousy luck. Um, and I think I'll just leave it there. Thank you. Um, one for Miguel. If we are formed in the image and likeness of God, is there vulnerability in God? 
Um, Good one. Huh? Well, it's okay. Are, are you interested in Trinitarian theology? Uh, we could do that. Um, uh, a nice way in uh, the, the Christian understanding of God is the unmoved mover, the uncaused cause, the necessary being. Um, the way Christians understand that very big God who's not a creature, who's not a, a, piece of furniture, a piece of furniture in the metaphysical vision of the universe, that very big God did something in the creative act and is doing something right now as God holds us in being. It is an extension of love. It is a merciful act. At least that's how St. Thomas Aquinas talks about it. Creation itself is an act of mercy because it is unnecessary. It is uncaused. This does not have to be. This, this act of mercy from the one who is, the necessary being, the perfection of goodness, truth, and beauty, the order from which all order springs, and the order, uh, and the end towards which all order is oriented, that very big God, the one who we can hardly speak of, became flesh and dwelt among us to be near us and to be friends with us, to be near to us. This God who's more intimate to us than we are to ourselves came near to be with us. Uh, God made God's self present to us in a way, uh, in, in a way that reconciled healings, the wounds and injuries and burdens that um, we could not reconcile, heal, and attend to on our own. Um, the vulnerability of God, there's a certain attractiveness to the quick move, right? But we see God be, became flesh in the person and work of Jesus. Um, um, that's, that solves a small problem. That answers a small question. It's an important question. But the God that we worship is a very big God, but it's a God who's made God's self present to us um, intimately and deeply and profoundly. Um, that's the, that's the quick answer, but this is also a very big question mm -hmm. in the Christian tradition. Uh, and I mean, if the, 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 of the theologians in the room, and I'm sure there are many here, um, uh, I took one line, and uh, I could have taken nine other lines. Uh, I only know one other one, but there's lots of ways that that's been navigated in the Christian tr tradition to, uh, to acknowledge and respect and, un and recognize the, um, uh, the absolute transcendence of God and how that God is near and intimate with us. Um. There is, I can't find the, all of the cards now, but there was at least one card in here asking um, whether you had, um, either of you were familiar with the writings of Henry Nouwen, John Varnier, and the Larch community, and um, I'm brought to mind in, in asking, thinking about this question too, and I'm wondering about your, either, both of your reactions to this. Um, um, Jean, Jean Varnier has written a book called Reflections on the Gospel of John, and he says uh, in one chapter, talking about the story of Lazarus being raised from the dead, and why Jesus, uh, Jesus wept. That's when Jesus wept. Um, when he heard that, that Lazarus had died. And he just speculates. He says he has no way of knowing. But he speculates that maybe Lazarus was somebody with profound disabilities. That's why he lived um, in the house with his unmarried Martha and, 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 and Mary sisters. Mm -hmm. And maybe the weeping of Jesus was a response to the common vulnerability that they shared because he had assumed that Jesus was in touch with his vulnerability, you know, just like it hitting him that he was also going to die. God chose to embrace that part of our ultimate vulnerability. And that was, and that was, um, it's a, it's a beautiful reflection if you, there's a lot more to it than that. But what would your reactions be to that idea? It's a difficult one. I, somewhat related to the prior question, uh, if God is imperfect, why create imperfection? A well, part of the answer to that is free will, I suppose. If we were perfect, there might not have been any point in creating us in the first place because we would not have been able to get any better than we are. Uh, with respect to Lazarus, Maybe he had disability, maybe he didn't. That's a, a new idea to me. 
Um, Jesus wept. He could have wept because he was a dear friend of the family. He could have, it could be a symbolic. The act of bringing someone back to the to the bed to the, from the dead is emotional. Uh, could be part of the thought there that it's not an intellectual thing. It's you know, life is drawn out of Jesus. Um, and just little fragments of thoughts I have on that subject. Uh, never thought about it uh, deeply. Miguel, what do you got? I, 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 the way uh, I think about it, it's, it's through St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, I, I don't have many original thoughts. It's kind of, that, that, that's, that's the... Um, with with uh, St. Thomas, he, in, in, in the tertia pars, in the third part, uh, he talks about... Uh, uh, and it's, it's uh, questions 14, and I think it's 14 and 15 or 13 and 14. Uh, he talks about the uh, defectum, the defects of Christ's body and the defects of Christ's soul. The word there is defectum, defectum. These were what was, uh, these, these were the aspects of the human condition that were, were, that were assumed by Christ in the incarnation, or the humanity that was taken on and received uh, at, at the incarnation, and what's one of the things that's always stuck out to me is uh, uh, that word defectum. In the 19, I think it was 19, late 1960s, early 1970s, uh, one of the first uh, English translate retranslations that came out in the 1960s and 70s that was actually translated as disability. Hmm. It was the disability of Christ's body, the disability of Christ's soul, and the word that's being translated is defectum. Uh, that Latin word defectum is not identical to the English word defect. There's a little bit of a connection there, but defectum, if you want to get a sense of it, it's de, de, without or away from, fectum, uh, action or ability, defectum. So away from action, away from ability. Disability is not a bad translation of that. Uh, uh, it, it works in, in a certain respect. So what was assumed by Christ at the incarnation? What, what was received, um, uh, 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 one person, two natures, God become flesh, uh, God received into God's self in the person of Christ uh, particular kinds of vulnerabilities, partic particular kinds of limitations, particular kinds of weaknesses, among them the ability to be moved and be changed and impacted uh, by pain and suffering and even death. Um, that's... Um, that is the marvel, that is the beauty of the incarnation, and that God was so moved. Uh, God incarnate was so moved to be broken at the loss of a friend. Um, that's, that shakes me. Um, so Jesus wept. Um, how wonderful, how wonderful the God we serve. Beautiful. <clears throat> Here's another one then um, that was directed to... Um, that was directed to Miguel, but uh, I'd like to direct it to both of you. We have heard that the church, we all that is, bishops, pastors, leaders, lay people, families, and children in formation, are called to change our thinking on disability, its meaning and its connection to the good news of God's loving plan. And we have heard about the experience of being inside or outside the curtain, the reality of the common expression of vulnerability, the need to be accepted, where only the family members and a few other experts in the field are familiar and available to reach out. What would be a simple step to incarnate a new way of thinking? Um, as I, I said somewhere in my talk, I think person-to-person -person contact is about the only thing that works. In a parish setting, and you can put notices in the bulletin or the website until your hand falls off, it it's just bounces off. And because the curtain is there, uh, anything which is not personal in nature, just some abstraction about disability, it's just going to go boing right off the, right out, right out into space. It's too easy to ignore those things. It's more comfortable to ignore those things, so why take them seriously? However, if you have a ministry in your parish and it's made up of a dozen people, two dozen people, some of the family, uh, particularly parents, uh, friends, what have you. I would try expanding that circle through person-to-person -person contact. 
So if I were a parent of a child with a disability and active in the parish ministry, I would talk to people I knew, invite them to something, some sort of event that would have to be designed, simply to get them closer to the reality so that they have a personal connection to it and so that the invisible curtain becomes obvious to them that it's first place that it's there and that it can be dissipated. Uh, because without that recognition, it's just e it's just easier to ignore the whole thing. So that's the way I would approach it. I, I, I'm reminded of uh, 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 this piercing, this uh, moving through, passing through the invisible curtain. St. Francis. Uh, 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 St. Francis, we, uh, we know the story. We recall the story of St. Francis who's riding along, and, and he received a, a, a word from God, uh, what is... Uh, um, what is bitter and ugly to you will become sweet and beautiful. And what is sweet and beautiful to you will become ugly and bitter. And he's riding along, he's riding along, and he's meditating, he's contemplating on this. And as he goes along his way, there's a, uh, there's a map, a, a leper, a man who is diseased, his flesh is, he's ill, he's sick, and he's clearly ostracized from his community, his friends and his family. And, uh, and there uh, he gets down, he offers, St. Francis offers a gift, and then he receives the kiss of the leper. Um, uh, it's, a, it's a striking moment, but what is striking to me is what happened after that. St. Francis gets back on the horse, and he's riding along, he's riding along, and um, he's, in, the, in the story that we have, one of the... Uh, Something changed. Something began to change. He began to see. And I've always wondered, like, what, what did he see? What, what was changing in him? Like, was his vision changed? Was it, was it something that was objectively ugly? That, and he had this like, cloud of beauty that was in between? What, what changed about the way St. Francis saw the world? By way of the kiss, by way of the encounter, the personal interaction, the touch, the intimacy, his own vulnerability, the vulnerability of another, I believe, I think St. Francis saw the truth of the dignity of the creature created in the image and likeness of God. He saw the, uh, the essential cause, saw the beginning, the origin of that creature and its eternal destiny. That's what he saw. He saw the truth. And... What is ugly and bitter, in a superficial sense, did become beautiful and sweet. And the superficially sweet and the superficially beautiful, yeah, he saw the ugliness that that tends to hide. So that's how I have tried, that's how I've understood what Dave wrote when, when it comes to passing through, piercing, moving through the invisible veil. It's, uh, it's encounter, it's spending time, it's being clumsy being okay with being clumsy, and embracing that clum the clumsiness of others. So I have one question here um, that is, uh, I'm gonna elaborate on a little bit too. Transitions can be difficult, grade school to grad school. For students who don't look disabled, we have to ask each professor to honor the authorized accommodations. Extra time is tough. Some of us fear asking for the extra time. Um, I got a B plus without my accommodations, but I could have gotten an A with them. I need extra time. I need to stop midway in a two-hour exam and lay down and meditate to relax. What suggestions can help for courage to be myself and use my accommodations in grad school? And in general, um, this goes to, I think, the um, experience that a lot of us have had, which is that support and help and advice, uh, it disappears as, as, as people with disabilities grow older. Um, when they leave high school or the you know, 21 years of age of the transition time, um, support and just people to talk to about questions that you have, they're just not as available anymore. Um, your children aren't as cute anymore. They're a little scarier. They're big. And no, when they, when they get 21, they're, they could be handsome, but they're not cute anymore. They're scarier. Um, there are fewer things, and there are fewer things in the church, fewer, fewer opportunities for participation that are natural. Um, I take my 24-year-old son to the kids' show that the church put on with Mary Poppins, and it's kind of awkward. You know, so, um, so in, in general, how, how do you... How do you um, how, 
how do we work at sort of mature um, support for people with disabilities on that side of the veil? Within the Catholic context, uh, well, I, the preamble to anything else I would say is what I said in the talk. I mean, you have to recognize folks for who they are with or without disabilities. And you can talk endlessly about what disability means if you look at it broadly enough. Uh, we all have disabilities one way or another. But the most obvious ones are the ones that we really end up focusing on. For adults in parishes, well, the, I gave you an example of one program that our parish is running really quite successfully, Young Catholics with Disabilities. That started out as a teen group about a dozen years ago. Well, the teens are now in their mid-20s, so they've aged out of the programs that, uh, that the state or the county might provide, but the parish is providing them with that very valuable monthly outing for them and their friends. Uh, that's one possibility. Uh, I would say, and a little bit more generally, if you have a ministry within the parish, its focus needs not to be just on children, but on folks with disabilities of any age. And you might even add, and this it gets complicated and more expensive if you do, the older population, which are moving towards disability, how do you include them in, that is a slightly different definition, but at least with, well, both uh, mental, developmental, and physically, it's not that much different from younger people with disabilities. So just to extend the, the, the question, it's not only adults, it's older adults. And uh, how can the parish minister to them? Dedicated people, creative people, and resources. Again, those numbers with the dollar signs in front of them. And I want to encourage whoever wrote this to come and find Miguel privately and ask practically about the grad school question, because as an academic, you might have some suggestions about that as well. Yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> okay. Um, how would you start um, to... Um, Oh, I'm sorry, I'm having trouble reading that. Um, what guidance would you have for college students who want to work with or are already working with people with disability? What is um, society um, n new? What's, what's new in society in working with people with disabilities and what needs to be done? So is this a, a student who's studying theology or? Um, college student. This is a college student who is working with or already working with people with disabilities. And the question is what would? And the question is what guidance would you have in general for somebody uh, entering into that field? Um, here's what I would say. You ready? Um, that is a very good question. I encourage you to be patient. <laughs> and to look and to read and to think deeply because what you find may surprise you. <laughs> that is, I, um, that's, I, that's the best advice that I think I can give, and it's good advice. Uh, if you are patient, if you read deeply, if you think deeply, if you learn from those who are exemplars, who, are, uh, who have been brave and courageous, um, uh, 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 whether they've been recognized or not, learn what you can and be patient. But you have to be patient. That's the thing. It's, uh, it's easy to try and uh, to, to grab it and get a hold of it uh, too quickly. Uh, you're not going to have it figured out in a year or two or three. It takes a lifetime to learn, just like it takes a lifetime to learn to tell the truth, just like it takes a lifetime to learn to be courageous, to be honest, to be just. It takes a lifetime to learn how to be a good human being and be patient. I see. And maybe I might, might add to a young person, step closer to people with disabilities. And if it's just an abstract uh, consideration, you know, what should I do in the abstract on uh, people with disabilities? Well, that doesn't get you very far. Uh, get closer, get to know some folks, and then maybe rephrase your question. Um, 
you'll learn from the experience, not just from reading about, but also your heart will change from the experience. So I would just add that element to it. So I get to have one closing question, and I want to ask this to both of you. Um, you hear a lot of students, when uh, stories, right? And, and one story that I heard, mom um, in the kitchen with her daughter with Down syndrome, um, who's a teenager, and the daughter asked, um, mom, will I have Down syndrome in heaven? And the mom is startled and says, I don't, you know, didn't know what to say. I, 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 the best I could come up with was at the point in time, um, no, I don't think you will. The daughter then asking her mom, how will you know who I am then? So, will my son have Down syndrome in heaven? The theologian will answer that one. <laughs> What do we hope? What is our hope? I think about uh, St. Augustine, the way St. Augustine thinks about this. He talks about the glorious wounds of the martyrs. Uh, this is in the city of God. Um, uh, he asks this question, uh, what, when, we, when we get there, what will be the situation with the martyrs? So-and-so had their head chopped off. So-and-so was drawn and quartered. Uh, so-and-so was impaled and, um, uh, you know, and had all those. Um, what will be restored at the general re resurrection? He's like, what, how, will we just have these monstrous fingernails and this monstrous hair? And he, he says, what is this going to look like when everything is made right, when we are restored and reconciled, when all is made right? What will it look like? And what will the martyrs look like? What will their wounds look like? Because it would be an injustice for there to be no memory, no history, no record of their, of their witness, of their gift to the church. It would be an injustice for them to not bear the wounds, to bear the marks. And then he talks about the wounds of Christ. And he says, we, we have in Scripture the, the, the glorious wounds of Christ, so what St. Augustine describes it as the glorious wounds of the martyrs. And he talks about the glorious wounds of the martyrs. It is those wounds, those injuries, those burdens, those challenges um, that were offered up, that were integrated and received and incorporated into the redemptive work of Christ for the world. They are glorious wounds. The scars are like crowns of glory. It is so breathtaking. You have to read St. Augustine's word. Go find it. Don't take my word for it. Go find it yourself. But the glorious wounds of the martyrs, the, these injuries, these burdens, these wounds that are redeemed, reconciled, and glorified, I think, I think it provides a way for the church to imagine and to think about what the glorious wounds or how our wounds, our burdens, our injuries, our limitations um, could be glorified. Um, as they are bound to Christ, integrated and connected and, and uh, brought into, perfected in, in the glorious wounds of Christ. Um, I think there's something there. Uh, I think that my brother would be unrecognizable. It will be a crown. If, uh, it will be a crown if, if he has, if his knowledge and love of God, and in his knowledge and love of God and his awareness of his limitations that uh, if that has been reconciled with God, uh, it will be redeemed. It will not be lost. It will not be forgotten. But it will be perfected. Mm -hmm. It will be perfected. It will feel, fill its proper place in the good order of God's creation. I might add just, just a very brief note. Um, I would say, first, honey, I don't know. <laughs> but then I would say, sure. You have Down syndrome, I don't. We're both human beings, and I'll recognize you in our humanity. Beautiful. Thank you, all three of you for that. We're so grateful. Thank you all. That was great.